Hi, and welcome to the Victory Church Podcast. We're so glad you could join us. If this ministry has impacted you in any way, we'd love to hear all about it. Please send us an email at share at victorychurchatl.org. We pray this message will speak to your heart. If this is your uh, first time here, if you are a guest with us, we want to welcome you to our fellowship, uh, Victory Church. We want to welcome you to our 1130 worship experience, and we want to welcome those of you who may be watching me on, on podcasts or YouTube. I want to welcome our online family. I had a chance to talk to so many of you last week on Instagram Live, and uh, as far as where is Miami and California, and um, our sister who watches us in Costa Rica, Melody, um, who first reached out to Melissa. Um, I want to say to you, if you translate this into English, that we love you. And, uh, and we thank you for watching from Costa Rica and, and that you are constantly in our prayers. So we welcome our entire online family and everyone to the house of faith. And I welcome you to week two of a series, um, a rally cry, a collection of teachings through the letter of Jude. very small and hard-headed and letting preserve for us in the New Testament of the Bible. And, uh, you know, I, um, you know, as God put this in my spirit, I look across our, our country and our nation, and I believe that the letter of Jude This message is needed now more so than any other time in world history. And I guess my fight is in this message, in this series, in this collection of talks, my my real battle is is to try to awaken as many believers as possible that you are sharing my tears in prayer in this regard and that you will join us on the battlefield for a war that's being fought for something we must protect and stand for. And uh, what began as a cloud in the days of Jude, today has grown into a, a massive hurricane across the world and especially in the United States. And my cry from this pulpit, my cry to the United States of America, my cry is that We would hear the voice of Jesus speaking to us, all of us who are preachers of his word, that we would would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit beckoning to us, that we will begin to turn away from entertainment and turn away from just the appeasing of men, the fight to fill rooms and auditoriums, that we would see that we are living in perilous times and dangerously deceptive times and that we would come together as those who have been entrusted with the highest calling of communicating this word and that we would lay down the entertainment and lay down the antics and shenanigans and that we would take up the mantle of preaching this glorious gospel For revival will not come to our churches and our cities without prayer and repentance and gospel preaching. May so many of you join me in this cry from Atlanta to fight for the veneration of God, the preservation of biblical Christianity, and the spread of the biblical gospel. Join me, join us in that fight in this generation, in this hour. We need it more now than ever before. 
And instead of blowing me up on my DMs, stand up in your pulpit next week and take territory for the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't worry about who leaves. And don't worry about if they don't like it. You preach to the audience of one. And know that you and I will give an account for we will incur the greater damnation for how we handle this word. My brother and my sister join me here in the fight for the veneration of God to make him holy again in the presence of our people and for us to fight for the preservation of biblical Christianity and the spread of the gospel. Not the spread of our revelations, the spread of the message of Jesus inherent in that is the power to snatch people from the fires of hell. And may those who are watching who are not preachers, may the saint be awakened. And may the sinner be brought nigh to the feet of Jesus for the glory of Yahweh. Father, bless this word in Christ's name. You know, Frank, can you... Can you yeah. Just softly, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, my brothers and sisters, I, I, um, I'm going to be honest. This series is difficult to preach because I find that in, in America... It is very difficult to preach message that doesn't directly impact you for what you think is good. So if it's not speaking about eight steps to getting something, and if it's not speaking about three steps to a turnaround, we like to push away from those messages. But I find in America messages that call us to mission and messages that call us to corporate sacrifice are ones we push away from the table from, we want nothing to do with, we won't say amen, we're not gonna throw the towel at the preacher that's calling us to gospel mission in America because we are not contributors here, we are mostly consumers in this nation, we are not fans, but we are mostly, we are fans but not most disciples of Jesus. The F on our back says fan, but the tattoo doesn't say follower. The heart is burning for the next thing we can get, but not burning for how we can move the gospel forward. This is America at its finest as relates to Christendom. And so I find difficulty in preaching through Jude because nothing about Jude is for your personal benefit. But it is a corporate rally cry to Christians in this room, watching me across the country, around the world. It is a rally cry to all of us. Consequently, it is the most neglected book in the New Testament, and I wonder why. That the Holy Spirit will keep us away from the message of Jude, especially in a time where we need it more now than ever before. For the proliferation of TV, And media and social media has given us access to a cancer that is destroying the body of Christ. And it's important for us to understand history if we would understand the seriousness of what's happening right now in our nation. History. So let's start here. In the Middle East. An area of the world known to be a stronghold of one of the great three monotheisms of the world. Not Judaism, not Christianity, but Islam. That when you think of the Middle East, the first religion that comes to your mind is Islam. And when you turn on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, or any political affiliate, and there's any talks about the Middle East, what images do we see? Warfare, ISIS and Hamas, rockets and fighting. 
All of it surrounded Islam, peaceful Muslims and radical Muslims and jihad. When you think the Middle East, you think Islam. But very few of us who are educated enough to know that Islam was not always the stronghold religion of the Middle East. For less people, when they hear the word Middle East, think of the fact that this was, watch, the former stronghold of the greatest religion the world has ever known, Christianity. That Islam was not always the stronghold of the Middle East, but we never think of the Middle East, watch, as the birthplace of Christianity. It was in the Middle East that Christianity was born. It was in the Middle East that the scriptures unfolded and were written. It was in the Middle East a slim Galilean came walking over the Judean countryside, was baptized in a river Jordan, came out of there with the Holy Spirit descending on him, and it was in the Middle East that slim Judean, that slim Galilean gave birth to a religion that would change the whole world. All of that happened in the Middle East. It was in the Middle East that Christianity dominated the Middle East for 1,000 years, where churches were planted all around the Mediterranean rim, and you would be hard-pressed in the 1,000 years following the resurrection of Jesus to find any person practicing a faith outside of Christianity. For those of us who are true followers of Jesus, this should alarm you and I. Because the question you should be asking yourself is, what happened to the faith in the Middle East? If the faith is so strong, if the faith is so pure, if it was born by Jesus, how could it have been completely decimated in the Middle East? How could Christianity have been all but wiped out in the Middle East? In fact, when we went to Jerusalem, the smallest gathering of people were the Christians in Bethlehem, that city ran over by Muslims and Jews. What happened to Christianity in the Middle East? Why is this place so barren of biblical truth? For the loss of biblical truth is a catastrophic loss to any nation or territory in the world. What happened to the faith? It was the victim of several things. One, fierce persecution. The killing of Christians for the faith, the shedding of innocent blood. They burned them at stakes. People like Nero lit them like torches and used them for his garden. They stomped out churches and put men and women and children to death. They fed them to animals in the middle of Colosseums. The fierce persecution began to extinguish that fire in the Middle East. But you know what else? Apathy. Apathy. The lack of Christians caring about the biblical spread of the gospel and the aggressive discipleship of new followers of Jesus. But not only persecution and not only apathy, Christianity will shift away from the Middle East towards the West, towards Europe and America in which Europe and America now will become the greatest strongholds of Christianity. Europe began to grow dim, and now even in America, facts, Christianity is dying in the United States. And for all of our conferences, it boggles me, and for all of our money, and for all of our churches, and for all of our books, for all of our preaching, Christianity is dying in the United States, so much so we need missionaries to come here and preach to us the gospel we have lost. Facts. The church in China where the gospel is illegal is growing faster than in America. Facts. The church across Africa where Islam dominated that whole continent is growing faster than the church in America. Facts. The church on our doorstep in South America is growing faster than the church in America. Facts. 
Christianity is declining in influence in America. So hostile are people against biblical Christianity. Don't talk about the life of the unborn. Don't talk about not rewriting marriage. Don't talk about biblical Christianity. In fact, I saw a person write on social media this week, man, all of y'all Christians make me sick. Y'all need to just go to another country, another planet. Y'all making the United States an awful place. That's just the beginning of the times we're going into. We haven't seen persecution yet. Some of us, somebody attack us on social media, we crumble. We haven't seen persecution yet. And my fear, my brothers and sisters, that God might allow us to have a dose of that to awaken people in this country because it's hard to get a hold of people who are apathetic except they hear or except you break them. And I'm telling you right now, there's so much false preaching happening right now that we don't even have the strength to stand up against persecution. Some of us can't even make it out of valleys because we're so accustomed to eating cotton candy, we don't get enough meat to have strength to get out of valleys. What was the third thing that began to cause Christianity to lose influence in the Middle East? It is the very message of Jude. It is the very thing that Jude was writing about. Jude opens his letter and he says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God and the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, he prays for them, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. And then what Jude was saying next is that third thing that began to cause Christianity to wane in the Middle East is the thing that's causing Christianity, I think, to wane in the United States. Listen, Christianity is not waning in the United States because of fierce persecution. It's waning because of apathy and it's waning because of where Jude goes next. In verse 3, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. And so what Jude is saying, listen, the faith is being eroded, the faith is being attacked, and I was going to write to you about salvation, but instead, Scott, I decided to sit down and write a letter to you, Chelsea, that we must watch. Come together, hear the law of double reference. Jude talking then, the Spirit of God talking to you now, that we must come together those of us who are true followers of Jesus, don't hear a sermon, hear the Spirit of God speaking to you that we must come together wherever you are in the country and we must contend for the faith that was once and for all handed down to us in blood by Jesus and the apostles. Why? Verse 4. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago, secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who changed the grace of God into a license for immorality, and they denied the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he's saying, watch, Christianity was being threatened and lost because of false teaching and false teachers. Now, some of us, you hear this, and it doesn't move you. It's not eight steps to get your house. Yet all of us, and I mean I say all of us, some of us like me, know the tears and the pain of seeing someone who was once on fire for God. Their faith now has been completely shipwrecked. Why? Because something they read on Google. Or some conference they went to. Or some book they was reading. Or some movie they saw. And they begin to dig deeper into that thing until it led them astray. I know people right now who was once on fire, served with me as a youth pastor right here in Atlanta, was preaching, singing, and making disciples, angel. And right now, their life is full of so much demonic activity. Their life is so dark and dismal. And why? Why is their life dark and dismal? Because they gave their ears, which is access to their soul, to bad teaching. And what we don't realize, minute, listen, bad teaching will create bad believing, and bad believing will shipwreck your faith. And do you know why Christianity is dying in the United States? Lack of biblical preaching and true preachers. 
And when he says about these men, these godless men, that word men there in Greek is a non-gender word, which means men and women. Your favorite fill in the blank he, your favorite fill in the blank she. He said they slipped in among us. They're in your social media. They're on television. We invite them to our churches to preach. We put them on TBN and on the Word Network. Why? Because they can raise money, but they're full of dead men's bones on the inside. I don't care if y'all never put me on the network. But where Jude goes next is the most graphic description of the men and women that are destroying in the faith right now. And what he says about them, I need no points. The scripture itself will preach to you. For Jude will now describe to you and I the type of men and women that were destroying the faith in his day and are destroying the faith in our day. And watch his description with them. First he opens up with the judgment they're going to receive. Verse 5 through 7, he says, Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their position of authority, but abandoned their home, These he kept in darkness bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities and surrounding towns, gave themselves up for sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment, watch, of eternal fire. So first Jude says, of all of these false teachers, here is what's coming for them. Judgment if they don't repent. Eternal fire if they don't repent. Why? Because they're messing with the thing that's most precious to God, his sheep. So he gives three Old Testament examples of judgment against rebellion. First he talks about the nation of Israel, a body of believers, two million of them, that God brought out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery, watch, and promised them, I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Watch. But as soon as they got out of Egypt, watch, we do this all the time, God brings us out of the world, we into a little bit of difficulty. And then we start crying, it would have been better for me to go back to where I came from. My life before the faith was better. My job before the faith was better. And so we start grumbling against God. And then we learn that his promises become probability when we are rebellious. But nobody preaches us that because we don't want to hear sound doctrine. So we got teachers who preach to you promises but don't teach you about character. So they will preach to you about the promises of God, but they won't teach you that your character can ruin the prophecies of God over your life. So they'll get you excited with eight promises, but won't tell you live right or you might abort those promises. So they'll teach you about blessings, but they won't teach you about righteousness. They'll teach you about acquisition, but they won't teach you about abstaining. They will say, believe God for your boo, but they won't tell you come out the bad relationship that you're in. They will preach to you freedom, but they won't tell you stop doing that thing that keeps leading you back to what had you bound. So he promised these people a land. Watch. And he killed an entire generation of people who were complaining against him. And what they were supposed to have, they missed because of rebellion. Then look, he talked about angels that didn't keep their position. I'm just trying to teach you because I love you. Who are these angels? They're the people that talk to you when you go see Miss Cleo. They're the people that write the horoscope that you keep following. I'm not a Sagittarius, I'm a Christian. You're not a Gemini, you're a Christian. 
You're not an Aquarius, you're a Christian. See, that offends you because you've never been taught the truth. Where the Bible says stay away from that because it's highly demonic. And the scripture says fortune telling is demonic. I got a Zodiac tattoo on my arm that my wife told me go cover over because it's demonic. I got that when I was watching in ignorance. I know you Virgo, but that's demonic. Cover it up with a flower. <laughs> or just get another tattoo that says BC under it, before Christ. <laughs> Woo. I felt the spirit of God in that. We all getting tats this week. I'm getting new ink this Friday. Oh, hold on, hold on, Marquavius. I hear the religious people saying to me, didn't God say tattoos are evil? Let me, let me talk to them for just a second. Right. Yeah, give me that camera. Yeah. In the Old Testament, it's why we need teachers who teach us in context. Tattoos, when God said don't do them, was connected to idol worship. Is there anybody in the New Testament with a tattoo? In the book of Revelation, there is a man who John said his eyes are like a blazing fire. His skin was like brass. His hair was like, like wool. And on his thigh is tattooed a word, King of Kings and Lord of On his thigh. The scripture says what? It is written on his thigh. Don't send me no DMs, read. It is written on his thigh. But he don't have a zodiac sign. King of kings, Lord of lords. His tattoo makes, watch, sense. Yes, I'm getting new ink this Friday. Garden tomb, 12, 8, 18, when God changed my life to go with the ink on the inside of the arm that says make much of Jesus and advance the gospel until I call you home. And Isaiah 6. These angels are now demons, the ones that harass and torment men and women, the ones that whisper in the ears of husbands and whisper in the ears of wives and make them fight each other in the kitchen, the ones that lead you astray when you see Miss Cleo, the one that listen to our prayers and bring attacks from his general. What did the scripture say about them? They left the abode of heaven, why? Because when Satan rebelled against God, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, he was kicked out of heaven and he took a third of those angels with him who became fallen demons now. And then he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities known for perversion. Watch, wiped off the map because of rebellion. And what Jude was saying, these false teachers that keep being rebel rousers of God's sheep, What's coming for them if they don't repent because of their rebellion? Judgment and punishment is coming for them. That shows us how much God values truth and how much he cares for his real sheep. Where are the real sheep at in this room? 
so much that God loves you, he will punish the person that lies to you. Wow. So God so loves you that if they don't repent, he will punish the people that has lied to you. That's how much he values your faith. So this is the this is the punishment of the false teachers. Now Jude will show us the character of false teachers. The next verses. In the very same way, these dreamers. Dreamers, what are dreamers? Men with unbridled ambitions. They watch. Pollute their own bodies. How? They are preaching, but in public and privately are immoral. You got how many chicks? You coming out of what place? You logging on to what site? You bound by what vice? And we won't seek help because in our pride we enjoy that and then get up and preach to God's people. Yeah, we got, we got gifts with no anointing. And charisma with no anointing. An anointing costs something. And when we feel that there's a sacrifice being paid for that in private. You can't live foul and have an anointing. These dreamers, they pollute their own bodies. Watch, they reject authority, which is as witchcraft. Watch, these are preachers, men and women that don't want, watch this, they don't want to be submitted to nobody. Who is your pastor? Who are your mentors? Who are you under? Don't tell me who you're over until you tell me who you're under. So no one can check you. No one can tell you about yourself. No one can tell you your crap stinks. Watch, and you need to sit down for a season. How you involve in that level of sin on, and then get right back up and start going on the road preaching. No one can tell us sit down for a season. No authority. Watch. No accountability. No one to say, man, woman of God, you are in error. I thank God for my pastor, Dr. Darius Daniels, who would check me in a heartbeat. I thank God for mentors like Bishop Bronner and other men and women of God who would keep me in account. I'm not just leading with no authority over me. He said they reject authority and slander celestial beings. Watch. Come on. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, what Jude is doing, he's quoting from an apocryphal book that is not in the New Testament. And in that apocryphal book, which I don't know where it is, but history tells us that in that book, Somebody wrote down about an argument that happened between the devil and an archangel over the body of Moses. Now the scripture tells us Moses died and was buried and nobody knew where he was. But according to that apocryphal book, Satan came, according to the book, we don't know if it's true, and said, I want the body of Moses because the flesh belongs to me since I corrupted it. But Michael came and said, no, this is God's man, and Michael fought with the devil for the body. Now, if you notice, even the archangel Michael had some respect for the devil because the devil's not just a demon. He is one of three archangels that God created in heaven. Read the scriptures. That God in heaven, his home, had all of these angels but created three chief angels. Michael, who's responsible for war. Gabriel, who's responsible for bringing messages. But there was another angel named Lucifer who according to Ezekiel chapter 28, body was made out of musical instruments and pipes. He was responsible for leading worship in heaven. And although he left his first house, he still is in his job because he still makes music. That's why some things will disrupt you when you listen to it in your ear. And that's why some people have committed suicide listening to certain type of music. 
And that's why there's certain genres, if you listen to the music, they're all about demons and things that are demonic. Why? Because the devil didn't give up the business of leading people into making music that glorifies death. Music that glorifies death. So the archangel Michael still, Michael still gave him his respect. Say, man, I'm not even going to slander the devil, but instead I'm not even going to deal with you. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Right. And we be doing that. Ah, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. But we don't have no respect for the devil. Michael could do that because he was right. We got to be careful talking to the devil like that when our lives are not right. Because apart from the Holy Spirit and apart from the word of God in us, we're no match for Satan. He is a powerful force, and without the protection of God, and without the word of God, and without the spirit of God, we're no ma- this body's no match for him. You don't believe that? Notice I keep quoting the Bible to y'all. J- Job. Oh, that dude is righteous. Yo, he always served you faithfully. Man, if you took away his stuff, he'll curse you. He only loved you for what you gave him. Job, money, house, car. Let me get at him for just a little bit. We see what he really made of. Because you don't know what's in you until you put the tea bag in hot water. So now watch God. Job, all right, I'm going to take down my protection from around him. You could do whatever you want, just don't take his life because the devil's on a divine leash. Where we be fighting over the devil's attacks, but I'm thankful that I know he can only go as far as God allows him. He can only go as far as God allows him. So if I'm in his will, God's will, I don't even have to fear death. For no matter what the devil does to me, he gets no glory. For my God will pull him back in and says, enough. They've been through this for three weeks, three months, three years. Enough. Look, they're still standing. Look, they still worship me. Look, they still lift their hands. Look, they still shout unto God. Look, they keep coming to church. Look, they're still faithful. Woo! Who am I talking to? Somebody shout unto God. That's how I like how Paul wrote, persecuted, perplexed, crushed, and beat down, even pushed to the point of death, but you will not take my testimony. You will not have my mouth, and you will not have my witness. Look, you're still standing. Look at all the hell you've been through, Shauna, and you're still standing. Look at all they do to you, Jordan, and you're still standing. Look at all you've been through, Veronica, and you're still standing. Look at all the hell you've been through, Kenny, and you're still standing. Look at what happened to you, Nadine, and you're still standing. Look at what happened to you, Angel, and you're still standing. Look at all you've been through, Marquavius, and you're still standing. Look at all you've been through, Philip, and you're still standing. Look at all you've been through, Shelly, and you're still standing. Look at all you've been through, Portia, and you're still standing. Look at all you've been through, Ryan, and you're still standing. Look at all the hell you've been through, Tiana. And you still stand. My feet are my testimony. Oh! Melissa 
and you're still standing. Hallelujah. Woo! And you're still standing. Woo! Woo! Somebody give him glory! Yes! Oh, hallelujah! Woo! Woo! Somebody shout, I'm still standing. Shout, I'm still standing. Shout, I'm still standing. Look at all you've been through, Michelle. I heard your cry, and you're still standing. Look at all you've been through, Shantice, and you're still standing. Look at all you've been through, Ashley, and you're still standing. Look at all you've been through, Justin, and you're still standing. Man, I gotta stop for just a second, man. Woo! Hallelujah, God!
Hallelujah. Mm. Glory to your name. Come on, mahogany. Glory You're still standing, Jesus. woman of God. Let the devil on a leash. As long as you're in the will of God, he can only go but so far. That's why my heart don't have to fear. No matter what I'm going through, my heart does not have to fear. He will bring me out or perfect me in. Bring me out or perfect me in. That's why you got to refuse to allow the enemy to rob you of your praise or your testimony or your faith. He's on a leash. For some of you, you don't even know you're on trial to give God glory. And you must come out on the other side. That our God can say to the devil, you see that one, you thought you had that one. You see, they didn't love me for the things that they had. They loved me for who I am. You see, you see, you took away their house and they praised. They went through the divorce and they praised. They lost the company and they praised. They got ostracized and they praised. They were the victim of betrayal and they praised. They lost almost everything except their mind. They've been to Hell's Kitchen and back. And they still hold on to my name. I'm telling somebody watching right now, as long as you're in the will of Jesus, you better remember that the adversary is on a leash. And no matter what hell you're going through right now, the grace of God is with you in the middle of that storm to bring you out or perfect you in. He's not only the God of the mountaintops, he's the God of these valleys. That, my friend, is biblical preaching. Can I finish this? Can can I finish? Just give me a few minutes. No, they don't want me to take my time, sister. I feel the spirit of God on me right now. They don't want me to take my time. I feel something burning in me like fire. Give me verse 10. Can I, can I finish this? I only got six more verses. Yet these men, these false teachers and false men and women, they speak abusely, uh, abusively against whatever they don't understand. So if they don't agree, they rail against it in ignorance. This is their character. And whatever things they do not understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals. So they're not led of the spirit, they're led of the flesh like dogs. These are the very things that destroy them. Verse 11. Woe to them. I don't know what woe is, but I don't want no parts of it. We're going to see it when we get to Revelation. A whole lot of woes and damnation. God says woe. And he don't back down from woe. And I don't know what woe is, but I don't want no parts of woe. I want mercy, not woe. He says woe to them. Watch. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed into the prophet of Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Three men. Cain, he said, man, false teachers are just like Cain. They kill out of jealousy for what other people have. Because they never satisfy with their own thing. They're always about somebody else's thing, so they try to slip in and get your own thing. They be mad at other people who live right, so they got to tear right people down and prop themselves up. Cain, he said they just like Balaam. 
Prophets who love prophet. Selah. Nah, y'all missed that. P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Who love P-R-O-F-I-T. Prophets who love prophet. Their whole ministry is about money. Their whole ministry is about gain. Their house, their car, their jet, their name. Their preaching is for themselves alone. Prosperity to pad their own pockets. How you got 200 people in your church and you drive in a Maybach? But no businesses and no books. Or you pulling up in, in a, where was that? Where was that, Lena? River, in Riverdale to a church with 100 people and a brand new Porsche. Now, I'm not knocking you for the vehicle. I'm just saying. <laughs> Be wise. Why you got to flaunt? Why is that necessary? Why every picture you sitting on a jag? Why is that necessary? What are we trying to prove by doing that? Man, I know them emails are coming this week. I know. I know. I know. What are, what are we trying to prove by doing that? What about a picture at the altar? Or a picture in discipleship? No, I'm being judgmental and closed-minded, said Philip. I know they're coming for my DM this week. Huh? They call me judgmental. No, I'm just bold to tell truth. I'm not judgmental. I love all people. Oh, let me finish because y'all don't want no more of this. Destroyed like Cora. Cora was a man who rounded 250 people to go against Moses and said, why you got to be in charge? We know false teachers like that. They come into the church and then they don't have their own platform. So they start rallying people to church to go against the pastor. Why you got to be in charge? Yeah, I'm going to put it out there. Why you got to be in charge? And so they come against you in your group me, and they come against you in emails, and they rail against you in meetings. Why you got to be in charge? That's what Korah did to Moses. You know what happened to him? It got him killed, and it got 250 people killed, and it got 1,000 more other people plus killed. Why? Because rebellion is contagious, and it'll get everybody damaged. He said, false teachers are just like them. Let me finish up. These men or women are blemishes at your love feast. Love feasts were gatherings believers had to fellowship. He said, they're blemishes at your fellowship. He says, man, it's a shameful thing to even invite them into your fellowship. He said, eating without even the slightest qualm. They do evil and wipe their mouth. Watch. They do evil and sleep. Selah. Shepherds who feed only their own selves, they rape sheep. They are clouds without rain. They appear to have the word of God, but they're empty. They appear to have substance, but there's nothing in them. Clouds without rain. We see that, but there's nothing falling that brings life. Clouds don't bring life. Water brings life. You got plenty of clouds in pulpits, but no water flowing out that pulpit. Blown along by the wind, they go wherever they want. They're autumn trees without fruit. They are people with no harvest of good. What kind of people like that? Uprooted, twice dead. Verse 13. They are wild waves of the sea. They do whatever they want, and no one can tame them. Foaming at their shame, wandering stars. They have no course of direction by God. For whom the blackest and darkness have been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, the seventh man who lived, prophesied about these men. Then he quotes from the apocryphal book of Enoch that is not in the Bible. He quotes from that book. He says, see, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone. And to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts and all they have done in the ungodly way. And all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against who? Against Jesus. Yeah, they mock him now, but they won't mock him in the judgment. So let me, let me, let me, let me land the plane with this. So, so, so here we see. 
characteristics of these false teachers. Verse 16. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Look at that carefully. Look, look. Jeez, oh, this is, watch. Everybody watch. Watch. They boast about themselves. I, mean, I just want to stop right there for just a minute. Go through your Instagram and then watch. Instead of always liking, watch what they say. Who are they propping up? Themselves or Jesus? Why is every post about you? You got to look for them because you can't. Every post is about you. Watch. And he said, look what he says. Watch this. And they flatter others for their own advantage. What do you call that? An opportunist. I want to be your friend. Why? Because I want your platform. All right, let me land the plane. Let, let me, let me, let me, let me, let, let me ask you a question. Everybody look at me. Let me ask you a question. Look at me. Look at me. What is the most valuable thing you possess? If you made every believer write this down in an essay, I assure you we would not have agreement. House, car, wife, husband, business, influence, so I can spread the gospel. <laughs> Resources, bank account. We even say my soul. And none of those will be the most valuable thing you possess but if I understand Jude correctly and what the apostles was trying to hand down you know what is the most important thing you possess the faith why without the faith your soul is in trouble it is the faith that gave you salvation watch it is the faith that gave you access to a holy God it is the faith that gets your prayers heard it is the faith that gives us wisdom for life, practice, and godliness. It is the faith that gives us guidance. It is the faith that gives me strength. It is the faith that gives me, watch this, community. Small groups, brothers and sisters. All of this we have access to, watch, because of the faith. And what is the greatest threat to your faith besides your own apathy? You know what is the greatest threat to all of those blessings besides your own apathy? Let me show you what it is. It's this thing right here. That's who Jude just described. And if you don't look closely, you let them right into your life. How, pastor? They write songs. Wolves in sheep's clothing. They preach sermons every Sunday. They rap and you buy their music. They on podcasts. They on Christian TV. They at conferences. They write books and you read them. They put articles on Google. No scripture, but you read them. And what we don't realize, they come among us and they look like sheep. They get close to you. And then they shipwreck the faith of believers. I see this happen all the time. A believer that was formerly on fire start listening to my spiritual mother, my spiritual father, some prophet, some apostle, some bishop, and then three years later, their faith has been shipwrecked. Because everybody should not have access to your ears because your ears is access to your soul. That's why some of us watch, you listen to too many people. Some of you argue with me because you listen to so-and-so during the week. And we listen to people that give us cotton candy but not enough word to sustain us in the middle of difficulty and trial. So, so how, how do I end this message? I end with the words of my Savior. Because Jude was not the only person that warned us about wolves. That's right. But your Savior warned you about wolves before Jude. Two brothers. 
Let's finish with the words of our Savior, John chapter 10. Because some of y'all have been quoting, oh, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but God comes that I may have life and life more abundantly. And we say that's abundantly for materialism. And we say the thief is just the devil. And we preach that because we don't have teachers that teach us in context. How dangerous are false teachers? Jesus warned us about them before Jude. I tell you the truth, we finish with the words of Jesus. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way is a what? Thief and a what? And a robber. What man is he talking about? False teachers. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman who is God, the Holy Spirit, opens the gate for him. And the sheep listen to his voice, Jesus. He calls his own sheep what? By name, Philip. By name, Kenny. He calls them by name, but how do we know his voice? The more word I know, the more I know his voice. The more time I spend in prayer, the more I know his voice. Somebody be saying, man, I'm trying to figure out what God is saying to me. If we open his word, we'll know what he's saying to us. And where his word does not speak, we have the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Watch. When he has brought all of his out, his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep, and his sheep follow him because, watch, they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. Nah, that wolf is not going to get me. I want somebody to say, man, that wolf is not going to get me. Watch, the more truth you know, the easier it is to discern a lie. They will run away from him. You know what run away is? Uh, unfollow. Conference, re refund. Book, burned. Music, tossed. Article, ripped. Podcast, deleted. My financial support, terminated. I might as well give that to victory. because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So he explained it. Therefore, Jesus said again, I'll tell you the truth. I am the gate. He is the way. For who? The sheep, Jesus says. All who have, whoo, all whoever came before me, you preaching anything other than what I taught, that's harsh. All whoever came before me will watch. They were thieves and robbers. You teaching stuff against Jesus, that's a thief and a I don't care how much they're blowing up in society. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be, watch, saved. How important is false teaching? It will cost some people their souls. Some people will be damned because they listen to false teachers leading them to hell. Big churches, half of them going to hell. Big Instagram, half of those followers going to hell. He will come in and go out and find pasture. You know what pasture is when we follow Jesus? Peace and rest for the soul. Here is your verse. <laughs> but the thief, the false teacher, led by the spirit and the devil, comes to do what? What does false teaching do? It steals, it kills, it destroys. There is context. What does false preaching does? What does false teaching do? What does bad doctrine do? It kills, it steals, it watch, destroys. But I have come that they may have what? Life, zoe in Greek. And life what? More to the full, joy, peace, righteousness, assurance. Now watch how Jesus finished. This is powerful. I am... The good shepherd, not that wolf. Watch. Even when his words hurt, 
he is still watch the good. Even when his words rebuke me, he is still the what? Even when his words confront me in my sin, he's still the what? The I am watched the Let's finish. The good shepherd lays down his Only one man did that on a cross. Watch this. So powerful. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. They don't belong to you, preacher. You think your church belongs to you. They don't belong to us. We are entrusted with them to steward for God's glory. And if we love them, we'll steward them with truth. We are hired. He doesn't own the sheep. Now watch the false teacher. So when he sees the wolf coming, his own people, he abandons the sheep. He runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock, destroys the church. Not here. Last verses. The man runs away because he is a hired hand. He cares nothing for the sheep. But Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. Who knows the good shepherd? Come on. Who in this room knows the good shepherd? Who knows the good shepherd? Who knows him? You know what is good? Truth is good. So how do I finish? Contend for the faith. Be aware of wolves in sheep's clothing. It is this that is destroying Christianity in America. And it's this faith that we must fight to preserve or we won't have something to hand off to the next generation. May we rise up like vigilant, militant followers and say for the glory of our good shepherd, we will fight for him and we will push back against those who mock him. In this matchless name we pray. Amen. We truly hope this message resonated with you and encouraged you in Christ. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please support the spread of the gospel by visiting us online and choosing the giving option that works best for you. And again, thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you next week.